Welcome to the webinar, Oral Cancer Screening for Today's Population. This webinar is sponsored by Bellscope VX, and I am your host, Joanne Jones, and will be presenting the information to you today. So I'd like to extend a warm welcome, and thank you for joining me. What are the learning objectives for today? First of all, to understand the current statistics related to the sexually transmitted human papillomavirus and its connection with oral pharyngeal cancer. Also, to define high-risk anatomical areas related both to HPV and non-HPV oral and oral pharyngeal cancer. So even though I will be uh, presenting quite a bit of information on the HPV segment of the oral cancer population, I certainly don't want to take away the importance of non-HPV oral cancer and some of the high-risk areas and information that is critical for us to be aware of as dental professionals. Thirdly, to recognize the subtle life-saving signs and symptoms that may accompany HPV oral pharyngeal cancer. That is absolutely critical as well because some of these signs are just so very subtle that they can often be missed. And finally, to compare and contrast the value of adjunctive screening devices designed to reveal what may not have been visible with white light examination. So who is today's oral cancer profile? When we look at this young man, and if I asked you if you were screening him for oral cancer in your practice, you of course would say yes. However, do we identify with this young man as being at high risk? Most of us are still pretty confident in thinking that, you know, the heavy smoker, heavy alcohol consumption, older man, older male is going to be the one that's at greatest risk. And yet the current trend that has been established and reflected in peer-reviewed journals now indicates that there is a shocking increase in the younger generation, predominantly male, and non-smokers. And this has been referred to as an epidemic by both uh, dental and medical communities. What about this next profile? 46-year-old fitness trainer pictured here, mother of three and loving wife, and really spent all her life dedicated to helping others obtain a healthy, well-balanced lifestyle. Our, my professional and personal life collided with Bonnie that is pictured here. Bonnie is my cousin. She was diagnosed with late, later stage HPV, oral pharyngeal cancer, the very week that I was preparing to present my research on this very subject on HPV-related oral pharyngeal cancer to our national association. As you can imagine, it came as a huge shock. It was a, uh, an ironic, crushing, really cruel um, test of, of fate or something that I really didn't expect to happen in my life. As it turned out, I was able to offer Bonnie a lot of encouragement because I knew that this type of oral cancer does respond more favorably to treatment. Despite all of her efforts in trying to maintain her health and to get through the treatment, we ended up, it was a very sad uh, situation, we ended up losing her on December 6th of 2012, which was a, a horrible blow to the whole family. Since then, it has been my mission to be able to further teach dental professionals some of the things that I learned along the journey with my cousin Bonnie. There were so many things that were subtle that I had no idea of and that weren't being provided in curriculum and in the teaching. So I'm very, very happy to be able to share that with you today. And also I want to thank you personally uh, for dedicating your time to participating in this webinar and taking this message back to practice. First of all, let's look at a snapshot of oral cancer throughout North America, both in the U.S. and in Canada. Let's take a look at incidents and trends. If we look at U.S. estimated new cases, we have 42,440. If you look down to the lower part of your screen, you'll notice that this is considerably higher than stomach cancer, liver cancer, and ovarian cancer, even though we hear so much more about those types of cancer. In Canada, oral cancer is the 13th most common, 
Overall, globally, it ranks the sixth worldwide. The number of new cases and deaths due to oral cancer is three times higher than cervical cancer and double the rates of liver cancer. And furthermore, overall, five-year survival rates for oral cancer are 63% compared to survival rates of cervical cancer being 75%. If you look at a number of the different studies, generally speaking, because of the later stage of discovery of oral cancer, what we find is that one person in two, so 50% of every person diagnosed today with oral cancer will actually be alive in five years' time. We are not making the inroads that we need to make. When we look at prostate cancer, breast cancer, cervical cancer through opportunistic screening, we've been able to make some tremendous inroads. Unfortunately, this is not the case with oral cancer. When we look at the percentage distribution of estimated new cancer cases by sex in Canada, we see that there are approximately 4,100 males and 1,450 females diagnosed with oral cancer. We, of course, have about one-tenth of the population of the U.S., so the figures actually are very close. When you look at the percentage distribution, you'll notice that on the male side, there are many other cancers, pancreatic, stomach, brain, liver, esophageal, and so on, that are much lower incidence than oral cancer. And same thing on the female side. We notice a number of them that actually are lower incidence than oral cancer. So what are the risk factors? Age is still a big one. Age meaning that the exposure uh, over time to certain carcinogens is going to increase the risk. Race and minority men as well, two to one for African American versus Caucasian, and a five-year survival rate of 33% versus 55% African American versus Caucasian. Gender specificity, if we look at non HPV related, related to alcohol and smoking in particular, we see that that gender gap has actually narrowed. And a lot of this is due to cultural changes, lifestyle behaviors that we look at over the last several years. Those of you that are old enough to remember the commercials, you've come a long way, baby, uh, talking about the smoking in the female sex being much more common and much more acceptable over the last few decades than it previously was. So we look at that gender specificity being more uh, geared towards the male with non-HPV related oral pharyngeal cancer, but it's about two to one. Now when we look at HPV related, depending on the study, there is a gender preference for males anywhere from four times to six times to eight times greater for a male versus a female. Tobacco products, marijuana, smokeless tobacco, all of these aspects, flavored cigarillos, all have a carcinogenic effect, even the electronic cigarettes. Marijuana has four times the tar burden of regular cigarettes. So again, these are high risk factors for non-HPV related. Alcohol consumption as well, and especially when we look at lifestyle behaviors, combined use of tobacco and alcohol. The suggestion being that alcohol increases the permeability of the oral mucosa to certain carcinogens from the tobacco smoke. Also prolonged exposure to ultraviolet light. Not so much at this point in time. Uh, and the reason being, again, is more public awareness. We also know that the incidence of lip cancer has declined, and the survival rates have climbed very, very high to about 90% five-year survival rate, which is great news. A lot of the reason for that, too, is that there is a lot more use of UVA, UVB, lip protector, sunscreen, and that sort of thing, especially for men who tend to be working more as far as occupational concerns in the outdoors and be more exposed to ultraviolet light. Dietary deficiencies, and in the, the news quite recently, there have been a number of studies that have been talked about related to breast cancer and dietary deficiencies. When we look at the link with oral cancer, it's a looser link, however, has been defined as a risk factor. Beta carotenes, antioxidants, the effect on free radicals in the body, 
all have an opportunity to present a stronger, better, more effective uh, immune system and not present an individual as being so immunocompromised. So there is a link with dietary. Population trends. Most of us would agree that our dental patient population today is quite diverse. And along with that, immigration has been a retention of some of the cultural behaviors. Let me give you an example. The use of beetle quid. It's a, like a, a leaf that's wrapped up in a pouch and placed into the buccal mucosa. Definitely has identified carcinogens. Also, the areca palm nut uh, used, again, in a, the pouch in the buccal mucosa area. And also a practice called reverse smoking that is actually practiced in East Asian countries where the lit end of the cigarette is actually placed in the oral cavity. Uh, immunosuppression, HIV and AIDS, organ transplant recipients are at greater risk. And this one is quite interesting. I want you to remember this. Previous history of oral and oral pharyngeal cancer to the tune of a 30-fold increased risk of second occurrence. That's very, very high. Also, the suggestion that poor oral hygiene may be linked to an oral HPV infection. And a lot of the research is pointing towards compromised sulcular epithelium, oral mucosa that may serve as a portal entry for the virus itself. So poor oral hygiene has been linked. But lastly, the human papillomavirus itself. And again, this is where a lot of the focus of the webinar is on because it, it's really caught us off guard. It's caught the medical profession and now the dental profession off guard. And we are into an epidemic with really very little knowledge on the part of the public as well as a disconnect in knowledge with the professional community. So let's look at sexual and lifestyle behaviors and look a little bit closer at this knowledge disconnect. We have the perfect storm right now. We have high divorce rates. We have performance enhancing drugs. We have online dating, although a, a very recognizable way of meeting people doesn't provide as much of a history or awareness of a person's behaviors. No vaccines for this generation or the older generation. Not practicing safe sex and high STI or sexually transmitted infection rates. When we look, first of all, at U.S. HPV statistics, this is quite alarming. 20 million Americans are currently infected with the human papillomavirus, and another 6 million become newly infected each year. HPV is so common that at least 50% of sexually active men and women will get this virus at some point in their lifetime. That was alarming enough. That was from womenshealth.gov. However, the CDC have released some new information as of March 18th. Get ready for this one. Approximately 79 million Americans are currently infected with HPV, and another 14 million become newly infected each year. So you can see what's happening. There is a trend for a very strong escalation in HPV-related disease. On north of the border in Canada, 75% of Canadians will be affected. Knowledge is, of course, our best defense in this area. Limited public awareness, look as you scroll down when you get to the area of sexual activity. 24% or only one in four feel that sexual activity is a risk factor for oral cancer. This was a survey that was accomplished in April of 2012. When we look at amongst youth, in a recent study, nearly one in five adolescents did not know that sexually transmitted infections can be transmitted by oral sex. So they look to that type of sexual behavior as being a very safe sex, and yet this is causing the alarming escalation in HPV-related oral and oral pharyngeal cancers. So what is the connection here when we look at HPV and oral cancer? How did this become an emerging pandemic? We look at the original statistics that were published in 2011. We talked about HPV DNA positive tonsil tumors increased from 28% in the 70s to 68% in the 2000s. The newer information, and again, from data collected from the major cancer 
based registries only shows us from 1988 to 2004. So we still have quite a gap of information over the last 10 years that we're anxiously waiting for. But this, this figure does show an increase of 225%. Huge. On the other hand, and interestingly enough, a decline by about 50% in HPV negative oral cancers. They're suggesting that if this recent incidence trend continues, the annual number of oral pharyngeal cancers related to HPV positive oral pharyngeal cancers will surpass the annual number of cervical cancers by the year 2020. So right now when we look at the burden of HPV related uh, cancer, cervical cancer is definitely the most prominent, but we're seeing oral pharyngeal cancer second and now looking towards 2020 to surpass the annual number of cervical cancers related to HPV. So a huge, huge uh, new trend in HPV burden on cancers. When we look at this chart, we can see that on the yellow line, there is an increase, a trend towards an increase in oral pharyngeal cancers overall. When we look at the HPV negative, or the gray line here, we can see that there's a, a drop in about 1995, 1996, and then a steady decline towards 2004. And I would imagine that this has leveled off or continued to drop from reports from a, some of the other cancer centers. When we look at HPV positive oral pharyngeal cancer, we see an interesting climb and escalation towards becoming much more pronounced. And in fact, from here to here is that 225% increase. So let's put a little bit of common sense around the virus itself. There are more than 120 types of human papilloma virus, some from a harmless wart, and then a few that are high risk. When we look at the ability for the human papilloma virus to become oncogenic, we are really looking at nine strains that have been identified. And the transformation from the initial infection to actually becoming oncogenic takes a number of years. And the estimation is between about 15 and 30 years. So it is quite a long process. It's a double-stranded DNA virus, and it infects the epithelial cells of the skin and mucosa. So there are many, many areas of the body that are affected, cervical, uh, anal, oral, all areas where there is similar mucosa. HPV 11, 6, 11, 16, and 18 are related to a venereal wart and present in the oral cavity as condyloma acuminatum. These are all sexually transmitted. Over 90% of HPV positive oral cancers are HPV 16 positive, which is also associated with nearly all cases of pre-invasive and invasive cervical neoplasia. The HPV mechanism is really having an affinity for lymphoid tissues. The viral oncoproteins, and you'll see often uh, the words E6 and E7, are said to deregulate the specific tumor suppressor proteins. So if we look at an affinity for lymphoid tissues, the virus itself is able to get into, for example, the tonsillar tissues, able to get in contact with the immature basal cells, and with these viral oncoproteins, E6 and E7, causing suppression, we all of a sudden start to see tumor proliferation or tumor growth. And this is how it eventually evolves into involving the squamous cells as well and manifesting itself in an oral cancer or oral squamous cell carcinoma. So we can see that this transmission or this evolution really has certain characteristics to it that we need to be aware of. Our eyes don't see what our mind doesn't know. So I'd like to show you a few pictures of what HPV-related oral cancer lesions actually appear like in the oral cavity. Condyloma acuminatum is a cluster of multiple papillary nodes. They're attached with a broad base. They're persistent. They're painless. They can easily recur after being removed if there's re-inoculation between sexual partners. They are caused by HPV 611, 16, and 18 and are definitely sexually transmitted. 
which means that if we did see this clinical manifestation, we would then send our patient off for microscopic evaluation. If it came back as one of these viral strains, 6, 11, 16, or 18, and it was on a child, we would have to assume that there was sexual abuse that was happening, and of course reporting requirements would be, would be needed. It occurs on the lips, the tongue, the soft palate, also on the free gingiva. It's also known as a venereal wart and can be removed by local excision or laser ablation. Here we have a picture of what it looks like on the tongue. And I think the easiest way to kind of remember this is to think of it as a really small cauliflower. It's got a number of different lobes in it. It's attached with a broad base. It's adherent. We can't remove it. We can't rub it off without actually excision. And it appears, as I mentioned, as a little cauliflower. Here's another picture, another example on the lateral border of the tongue. And again, it looks like a little cauliflower. Now on the labial commissure in this next picture, it looks a little bit different. We've got a, a different type of clinical manifestation. But again, many different little projections, white in color, and easily recognizable. All of these lesions, of course, would be required for further microscopic evaluation. This is one of the most important slides right here. So if you're sitting in front of your computer, you're watching this, please grab your phone. Feel free to snap a picture here because this is a very, very important uh, slide because these are symptoms we can't afford to ignore. Hoarseness a change in your patient's voice for no apparent reason, a continuous sore throat, a persistent infection that doesn't respond to antibiotics. Could it be that you know, possibly the patient had a secondary bacterial infection and that the antibiotic kind of calmed it down a little bit and there was a slight clinical improvement following the course of antibiotics. However, the infection never seems to go away totally. This may be suggestive of a viral infection. Pain when swallowing or difficulty swallowing, pain when chewing, continual lymphadenopathy, a firm palpable node, non-healing oral lesions, bleeding in the mouth or throat, unilateral ear pain, and this one is particularly important a lump in the throat or the feeling that something is stuck in the throat. I've heard this from many different people that have had or gone through treatment for HPV oral pharyngeal cancer. They describe it as almost like a like a kernel of corn or like a popcorn shell that is caught and no matter how many times they try to clear their throat, they just can't get rid of it. This was one of the subtle symptoms that my cousin had that was, that was so easily overlooked. It can often be mistaken for gastroesophageal reflux disorder or some other issue that is unrelated to what is actually happening at the base of the tongue or in the oropharyngeal area. Unexplained weight loss as well. A difference in speech, a slurred type of speech, a tongue that tracks to one side when stuck out, meaning again that if we have a tumor that has located itself at the base of the tongue or very far back in the oral pharyngeal area, we're going to have a limited ability or have the tongue impeded from being able to have full range and being able to move back and forth. Also, when we look at the tonsillar area, we want to look at symmetry. If there's one tonsil that is much larger, inflamed, irritated, again, you want to look at infection and investigate that further by referral. So HPV and non-HPV, where are the high-risk anatomical areas? HPV positive, as I mentioned, has an affinity toward lymphoid tissue, so especially lingual, palatal tonsillar areas, base of the tongue, the soft palate, and the oral pharyngeal area. So we want to think a bit more posterior, but we also don't want to overlook the floor of the mouth towards the posterior, underneath the lateral borders of the tongue, and the lateral border of the tongue towards the posterior as well. These are common sites for HPV lesions. The other areas that I want to, of course, focus on are the non-HPV, but very high-risk areas as well, which include more of the anterior area of the mouth, the anterior segment of the tongue, the palatal tissues, the floor of the mouth. 
And an easy way to remember that, I often refer to that in my lectures as the triangle of death, meaning that up at the top of the triangle, we're looking at the palatal tissues. As we move down, we're looking at the lateral borders of the tongue and the dorsum and ventral surface of the anterior segment of the tongue, and then the floor of the mouth area. So that, again, is often referred to as that triangle of death, high risk area related to non-HPV oral cancer sites. This next picture is an overview of a systematic examination of lymph nodes. And for ease of demonstration, it's, it's best to uh, really establish a systematic order so that an area is not eliminated from examination. So number one is starting with submental. Number two is submandibular, which I want to talk about further in the next slide. Number three is the cervical chain. And we want to have, as we're anatomically landmarking around the sternocleidomastoid muscle here on the neck, we want to have our patient turn their head as depicted here so that our fingers can fall right into this medial aspect and be able to palpate further. Supraclavicular nodes in the uh, hollow just above the clavicle area are an area where we get afferent and efferent drainage and can sometimes be the first sign of something going on in the head and neck. And also the thoracic cavity, the GI, the breast area related to malignancy. As we go further, number five is the occipital node, just below the occipital bone. Number six is the postauricular, and number seven is the preauricular. Now for all of these areas, or for the majority of them, you're going to use bilateral palpation. However, I want to draw your attention to the submandibular nodes. It's wise to commence initially bilateral palpation and do a gentle kind of rolling stroke to determine if there's anything that stands out as being a swollen or enlarged. But in order to identify the earliest sign of a very um, initial stage of an involved node, it's critical that we embrace some firmer techniques. And a unilateral palpation is recommended. And you can actually do this as you're watching or as you're participating in this webinar. And I'm going to show you the picture here so that will help to illustrate this better. My left hand is actually demonstrating, whereas the right hand is just cupping the side of the face or holding the side of the face uh, to balance the head. But when we look at the left hand, you can see that my fingers are cupped under the angle of the mandible. We're going to place quite a bit of pressure, a firm pressure in there, and then we're going to have our patient put their chin right down to their chest. And try this out as I'm talking about it, because you'll notice that your fingers will be able to get in much deeper. And then we're going to have our patient bring their ear over to their shoulder. So we cup our fingers, firm pressure under the mandible, chin down, ear over to the shoulder, and with firm pressure we palpate with a rolling stroke in there to identify the earliest possible enlarged node uh, through extraoral palpation. When we look at lymphadenopathy considerations, what if we do find a swollen lymph node? How do we manage that? In the broadest of terms, an infection related feels like a blueberry or, or almost like a, like a pea. They're soft. Your patient will often be aware of it. It'll be painful or tender. That Your patient will tell you, you know, I've had a sore throat for a while that I can't get rid of. Uh, it's movable. It's not fixed. Where when we look at the other side, again in the broadest of terms, neoplasia related, it's firm. It's usually not symptomatic, so your patient will normally not have an awareness of this particular lesion or anything going on in the oral cavity or the head and neck, it's fixed. You can't move it around. It's fixed like a little stone or a pebble. So very different from the blueberry type of feeling that's very movable and soft that is infection related. When we look intraorally, again, it's wise to have a systematic order. So lips, labial mucosa, buccal mucosa, gingival tissues, I would suggest a little tip that you dry the tissues with a two by two, because again, if there's a human papilloma uh, viral lesion on the free gingiva, sometimes if you have a little bubble of saliva and you've got the reflection of the overhead light, it's very difficult to see this and actually discover it in the earlier stages. Then we go into the critical areas, the tongue, the floor of the mouth, the oral pharyngeal, and the palatal tissues. 
a call to action if you're not wearing loops or magnification to examine the oral cavity you definitely are not going to be able to discover things in the earliest stages and even then we're compromised which we'll talk about further high risk areas the tongue the dorsum the lateral borders and the ventral surface when we have our patients stick out their tongue you want to ask them move it side to side. We're looking to see if that tongue tracks to one side, as I mentioned earlier. We're going to feel as well. We're going to palpate with our fingers on the dorsum and our thumbs running along the ventral surface underneath. We're looking for areas of change, texture change, areas of induration, hardness, anything different from one side to the other. When we look at the lateral borders, it's so important to look. Look with magnification. Feel so that again you can detect the earliest possible change. And the best way to get that full protraction, because remember, HPV related, we want to go to the very back areas as far as we can, past those, uh, the landmark of the circumvallate papilla on the dorsum, past that area on the lateral border as much as we can. So roll out, unfold the two by two, roll it into thirds, make a little hammock and grasp the tongue that way. And of course, don't forget to look under that area when we're examining the tongue. When we look at the underside of the ventral surface, again, look and feel. You want to feel for any changes. The floor of the mouth is a particularly vulnerable area. When we're compressing intraorally, we must have placement of the other hand extraorally. This is the only way with bimanual palpation to detect an area of induration or swelling in the earlier stages. Otherwise, just intraoral evaluation is not going to detect it. So when we're doing that anterior area, non-HPV related, we want to compress as fairly heavily, pretty good firm pressure. So you'll actually feel your fingers meet. As we, of course, head towards the posterior, we won't be able to have this contact because of the musculature in the neck and the floor of the mouth. However, we want to go back as far as we can underneath the tongue because these are the areas that are now HPV related. The palatal area, the tonsils and the oropharyngeal are that last critical area. Visual and tactile palpation of the soft palate and then looking at the entire area of the oropharynx with particular attention we want to really look at those tonsils. Best way is to use a tongue blade or a mouth mirror, place it gently on the back of the tongue, have your patient take a deep breath in and say ah and this will raise up the uvula so that you can see that posterior wall with better visual acuity. So that area again is very critical for HPV related oropharyngeal cancer. The problem, though, is late stage discovery. As I mentioned, in over 50 years, we haven't made any, any inroads at all. There is a huge need for change at this point in time, especially with this new epidemic on board. I love this picture because it really illustrates the best, um, more accurately than I could describe it, as far as the development of oral cancer. What we see, that little tip of that iceberg, is often by no means representative of what's going on well below to that basement membrane. If we look at this particular slide, over to the left is the basement membrane. This is where abnormal cellular development starts. As we start to progress into moderate dysplasia, we get more cellular development pushing up from those basal cells. We get into a much more involved severe dysplasia, and then when we have clinical manifestation, we have carcinoma in situ. Unfortunately, when the basement membrane is breached, as it is in this last picture, this is where 67%, two-thirds of all oral cancer is currently discovered beyond this stage. That's why we're not making the inroads that we need to make. That's why people are dying of this disease, and that's why those that survive have a very compromised quality of life because of the invasive type of surgery. But don't take my word for it. I want to go to the Journal of the American Dental Association, see what they have to say. They speak about the limitations of the clinical oral examination in detecting 
dysplastic oral lesions and oral squamous cell carcinoma. And I'd like to read the quote. This is from the Commission Literature Review. On the basis of the available literature, the authors determined that a COE of mucosal lesions generally is not predictive of histologic diagnosis. The fact that oral squamous cell carcinomas often are diagnosed at an advanced stage of disease indicates the need for improving the COE and for developing adjuncts to help detect and diagnose oral mucosal lesions. I'd like to introduce you to something that I've had in my clinical practice for years, the Velscope VX. It's a two-minute exam that could save your life or save a number of lives within your practice. More than 25 million Bellscope VX examinations have been performed by over 12,000 dental practitioners in 23 countries. The technology is also backed by more clinical studies than any other adjunctive device for tissue fluorescence visualization. Yes, there have been a number of other devices that have emerged, some have come and gone, but have piggybacked onto the clinical studies that Bellscope has established as being a leader in this technology. They've been recognized as a global market leader with global recognition. We're all aware of the WHO or the World Health Organization. It recognized Bellscope enhanced uh, oral assessment system as an innovative device that addressed a global health concern. Bellscope was only one of eight devices to be honored and was the only dental product recognized. So let me give you a crash course on how the technology platform actually works. It has been used in the cervix, lungs, and the colon, and it was embraced for the oral cavity uh, probably about eight years ago, seven or eight years ago. It was within the last decade. When we look at normal healthy tissue, we look at tissue that is full of enzyme activity and normal metabolism of healthy tissue. If we remember back to Krebs cycle that we never thought we'd ever have to hear about again in our lifetime, well, it's coming back to haunt us because there is uh, an enzyme called flavin adenine dinucleotide. And it is an enzyme that is involved in Krebs cycle in normal healthy metabolism. When we use the safe blue wavelength, or the safe blue light that is emitted from Bellscope VX, when we shine that through, it shines right through to the basement membrane. With the presence of healthy tissue, there is a lot of this enzyme activity, and it is able to fluoresce back to us in real-time feedback as an apple green glow. However, when we get abnormal cellular development, there are a few changes that start to occur. We get breakdown of collagen, breakdown of the stroma. We have vascular changes where we have more blood flow to the area. And we have a drastic reduction of this enzyme activity that I previously referred to, flavonadenine dinucleotide, or FAD, it's an easier way to say it. Um, this, this particular drastic reduction demonstrates in contrast to the healthy apple green glow, it will demonstrate a very dark, well-defined border against or in contrast with the healthy apple green glow. As I mentioned, there are many journals that have represented uh, studies related to direct fluorescence visualization and specifically Bellscope. Uh, peer-reviewed and, and many of the most prestigious journals that are available to us in clinical and cancer research. What we are looking for is a unilateral presentation as opposed to a bilateral presentation. We're looking at uh, looking for irregular or non-symmetrical shapes when we're looking at things that should raise a red flag to us. Well-defined or well-demarcated borders and as I mentioned, abnormal patterns that spread across different anatomical structures. This particular study that's referred to on the left of the slide was a clinical study that employed a low risk population because there has been great sensitivity and specificity in high risk populations, but Bellscope has gone on further to demonstrate its efficacy in low risk populations. Here we see that uh, with 620 low risk patients, Bellscope helped catch 28 lesions, including five dysplasias that were missed by the naked eye. If we look at normal tissue patterns, let's look at some of the principles. Sometimes there is keratin in the tips of the papilla or there is blood perfusion. 
keratin shows up white. So when we look at this area here, we can see on the first slide and the one below it that we have those little uh, papilla tips represented by the white keratin. Also, some of them, because there's blood in them, you get this gray kind of diffuse pattern. And we can also see on the right-hand side of the screen a little bit of a wear pattern on the side of the tongue and some atrophy of papilla that has occurred maybe from bruxism or occlusion for that particular patient. So you can see, again, that wearing uh, demonstration in the velscope picture as well, the velscope image. When we look at pigmentation, pigmentation or melanin absorbs the wavelength and we see exactly what we see in the oral cavity. We see a direct reflection of melanin absorption of the wavelength. In this particular area, we see the tonsillar area here and this is bacterial presence and that will glow orange as well on the back of the tongue we can see this orange glow. What we see here is another fairly common occurrence. These are called lymphoid aggregates and you'll see these in a number of your patients that represent uh, the majority of cases an innocuous situation that may be a response to a previous infection. This is a great picture. This is an aphthous ulcer. And it demonstrates a number of different things. We have a fibrin clot here in the ulceration, so we've got a white representation. And right around the immediate area of trauma, the highest degree of inflammation, we see this darkened border. But as we move away, we've got a very diffuse area here that shows up, that moves away from the area of primary trauma. It would be the same if we uh, compared this to like a, like a sliver in your hand where Right where the trauma is, where the entry of the sliver would be, the tissue would be quite red. But as you move away from that area of trauma, you notice that it becomes more pink in color and less, less of, a, of a heightened red color. Same thing with fluorescence visualization. Diffuse patterns for inflammation. And actually, if you took the back of a mirror, and use something that we call dioscopic pressure and put a little bit of pressure here, you would see that the diffuse area would actually blanch white under velscope because the blood is able to move there. So bilateral presentation is a good thing. And what we see here is on the right-hand side, the fluorescence visualization picture, we see this diffuse pattern that reflects the increased vascularity on the tonsillar pillars and the oropharyngeal wall. We also see this orange aspect here that suggests bacteria on the dorsum of the tongue. Let's take a look at what dysplasia looks like in oral cancer. And you'll see how it's so easy to miss. This looks fairly normal. And again, it would be very small in comparison. And also without the use of uh, loops and a headlamp, it's sometimes difficult to see these posterior areas. Now have a look with Velscope. What you can see on the right-hand side is a very well-defined demarcated border here that stands out in contrast with the apple green glow of the surrounding area. Upon microscopic evaluation, that was determined to be carcinoma in situ. Again, this never would have been discovered without direct tissue fluorescence. Here's another case. To the left, we see mild dysplasia, but on the right was actually carcinoma in situ. Again, could have easily been missed. Now, remember back when I said that there is a 30-fold increase for a second occurrence of oral and oropharyngeal cancer. I want you to remember that as we look at this next group of pictures. In figure A, we can see the area of clinical manifestation of a leukoplakic, erythroleukoplakic lesion. There's a little bit of a, a erythroplakic lesion there as well. If we outline that, we would then assume that the gold standard would be to take a 10 millimeter clearance around that area for excisional biopsy. However, with the use of velscope and direct fluorescence visualization, we see a fluorescence value loss here that actually extends way beyond the border of the clinical lesion. And it is outlined in green on figure D. Figure E then depicts the gold standard of a 10 millimeter margin around the surgical specimen. So this is where the excisional biopsy was actually performed. Now let's take a look at what the results were. The red circle indicates what was actually visible 
with the naked eye and of course with with Bellscope. When we look at the green circles, these were not visible with the naked eye. These were only visible with the use of direct fluorescence visualization and specifically Bellscope. The blue circles or the mauve colored circles were actually areas that were not visible with either Bellscope or the naked eye. So when we look at this, we can see that if we had done that 10 millimeter clearance, she would have easily missed this area. And that's how a lot of times dysplasias are not caught or the clinically visible lesion does not remove enough with the excisional biopsy. And this is where uh, the FDA and Health Canada have provided Bellscope the, as the only device to determine surgical margins of its nature. The test results or the study results were 18 of the 20 patients showed dysplasia or cancer beyond the clinically visible lesion. And 50% of the tumors exhibited cancer or dysplasia at or beyond the traditional 10 millimeter surgical margin. Now we can start to make some better inroads. Photo documentation is so important too, especially when we're referring. This is the setup that I have here. The camera is customized, comes with the package of Bellscope BX and just as a flick of the wrist and attaches right on. This is what I used to have a number of years ago. This is an adapter. Still worked quite well, but this is this is fabulous. The one with the custom camera solution is, is seamless capture. And also there is an SLR adapter that fits if you want to use an SLR camera. And the thing to remember too, first of all, if you're looking at an adjunctive screening device, it's wise to always have an ability for photo documentation. Otherwise, to send this off for referral and management is going to present some challenges because your referral base may not have the technology. Secondly, you want it to be seamless capture where you don't have to have two hands trying to fiddle around with uh, some different type of applications. It's easy if it is just seamless. You can look through it and capture the picture uh, with one seamless step. With clinical assessment, management, and referral, again, in the case of an abnormal lesion with an identified etiology and patient awareness, we're going to remove the causative factor. That's what we would all do as dental professionals and reappoint in 14 days for observation. However, Oh, then again, sorry, if the abnormal finding has resolved, there is no further microscopic investigation required. We're going to continue to monitor for recurrence. But if not resolved, further microscopic evaluation is required. Or if we see something that we know is not normal, there's no point in waiting. If there's no known etiology, there's no suspected trauma, and there's a red flag, we should be sending that off sooner than later. I do want to address sometimes the question about false positives with adjunctive screening devices. The only true diagnostic tool is a biopsy. Adjunctive screening devices are just that. They are screening devices. There are no false positives because they are not a diagnostic tool. We are critical thinkers as dental professionals, and this allows us another aspect to evaluate more effectively a visible lesion or something that may not have been visible with traditional white light examination. It is our ethical responsibility to refer and document this referral. And when we look at uh, the greatest incidence of litigation right now is referred to failure to diagnose. So this is a critical area for us to be aware of. We'd also like to share a couple of clinical resources with you. The first one is a medical history update, and I've created that through my company for my consultation clients, and I'd love to share this with you. Um, it does address a number of questions, but one of them related to today's webinar is, do you have a persistent sore throat? Do you have um, a feeling that something is caught in your throat? Do you have a, an earache on one side? Of course, addressing those subtle symptoms that we talked about. How you use it, your patient would fill it out while they're waiting in the reception area. It's an easy checkbox style, it's self-explanatory, and it takes about a minute and a half. It allows you then to be able to connect at a deeper level with medical history concerns that the patient may have expressed. And it also uncovers areas that we don't have time for. We don't have that extra time in our, in our dental appointment. 
I usually suggest incorporating this in the dental hygiene appointment and maybe doing every, every third visit with a patient. It would be redundant to do it every time. The second resource that we'd like to make available to you is something that I work together with uh, Bellscope on, and it is a reference guide to oral lesion documentation. So it's a simple, handy reference that talks about how you document an oral lesion. What about the size, the color, the mode of attachment, the margin, the shape? And it gives you all the descriptive words, which sometimes have eluded us after being out of school for a number of years. So I, I hope you will go to the Velscope website and download these, and I hope they are of great help to you in your clinical practice. In conclusion, with the acquired knowledge of risk behaviors, prevention strategies, and enhanced screening tools, our profession is strategically positioned to play an integral role in earlier discovery of an abnormal lesion, thus contributing strongly to better treatment outcomes, improved survival rates, and enhanced quality of life for our dental patients. I trust you will never have to experience oral cancer on your own or experience it with a close family member or travel with them as they receive their chemotherapy, their radiation, and the insertion of a feeding tube, or how they deal with oral mucositis that lines their whole digestive tract as well as the entire oral cavity. It is a horrific disease that, if you survive, leaves you with a very compromised quality of life, and those are the lucky ones. John F. Kennedy said it much better than I could ever say it. There are costs and risks to a program of action, but they are far less than the long-range risk and cost of comfortable inaction. Late-stage discovery, for some people, life will never be the same. For some people, life will not be an option, as it is not for my beautiful cousin uh, who passed on December 6, 2012. I would like to just call to action here that remind you you are doing a potentially life-saving exam. This is a non-negotiable part of the exam. Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't we use all of those tools that we have available to us and the science behind them to take a closer look? I want to thank you for joining me in the fight against oral cancer and on a, a personal level. I want to thank you for your dedication and your time and for taking this message back into your practice and sharing it with others. I, I really admire your commitment. Thank you so much.